Um, today, I'm going to discuss um, the labeling extensions that we would like to do for managing the sub functions. Uh, uh, feel, feel free to, to note down your questions, feedback, or comments. I have my email at the end of the slides. Um, feel free to send me your questions. Um, or if you prefer to discuss over a mailing list, then I have a link to um, QRFCs and patches. That's been posted. Uh, feel free to reply there, and we would be happy to discuss um, all your suggestions and, and feedback over it. So let's let's get started. Um, our, our my today's talk is um, mainly around three um, three topics. One is understanding the user requirements for uh, uh, creating configuring the sub functions. Um, the second piece of the puzzle is uh, what's the current state of the labeling and how um, how we would like to extend it. And the third part is the main is the design of how um, these requirements are getting addressed with the new extensions um, so that the user can use it. So, um, so today, as we know, um, users have, um, have been using the virtualization in various different ways. Uh, one that we know is um, one, one side is a VETH devices where we have a pair of um, VETH uh, one is mapped to the virtual machine or container, and the other side is exposed uh, to the switch. And all the PC configurations, um, including rate and cap, decap, um, is being done on the, the other end of the wire of the VTH pair, um, which is one side. The other side of the spectrum is uh, the e switch offloaded devices. Um, so far, we have been seeing uh, the SRIOV virtual functions where the VM uses the virtual function or the container uses virtual function. And the, the, the e-switch representation is our, um, exists for each of these uh, VF or a PF. And all the PC rules apply on the VK center device. Now, uh, the, the requirements that we hear from the users is um, the user should be able to create, configure, and deploy the sub-function device or um, a one device at a time, which is essentially a portion of the device that the user creates, um, configures, and deploys. Now, um, so far we have seen usually a NIC management is done through NCSI interface or uh, some of the proprietary interface. But with, uh, with the upcoming smart NIC devices, um, the NIC itself is running the Linux kernel. And and therefore, um, several of the applications can be run on the NIC, including uh, the most common one is running an e-switch there. So the user's um, primary requirement is that um, user should be able to create the NIC device from the NIC side and not from the host where the NIC is plugged in as a device. Now, as a user, we should have the same user interface. Um, regardless, um, this uh, virtual NIC or virtual device is created from the NIC side or from the, the host system side itself. Um, that's the most uh, second important requirement. Um, the third one is a, is a configuration, is that user should be able to configure the NIC uh, enough uh, before this NIC is being uh, given to uh, a virtual machine container, or in some cases, even a pixie driver which will start um, loading and booting on, on this device. So we want to make sure that the device is configured enough um, before these um, drivers can get access to the device. Um, as a user, we might want to move this, this portion of the device or a virtual function or a sub-function to the VM. Um, and therefore, um, all the... Um, all the driver facing resources being exposed uh, should be secure enough. And the most common one is the PCI bar. If we map a page of the bar, we want to have this as a composite or um, one page that is not mapped between two, two virtual machines. So the PCI bar resource is something which is dedicated and that we should be able to map um, as part of the sub function. From the use, use case or application point, um, user wants to configure and use this device either for a VM or for bare metal or for the container use case. Um, these are the 
um, these are the primary requirements for um, for creating the subconference. The second part of the requirement is on the eSpeed side. Um, as a user, um, user should be able to use the uh, the rich DC offload interface that we have for um, PF, VF, and SF in, in um, exactly the same manner so that all the infrastructure that exists today uh, can be leveraged. Uh, when, when we have the representer, uh, we want to make sure that the representer naming scheme is uh, correct from the day one. Um, in the past, we have seen um, uh, different naming schemes coming over uh, for the representers. And since it goes into a CSFS, um, the, the, the changing the scheme, it gives a bit of experience. So we want to make sure that the, the representer naming scheme, as well as the name, um, we have a deterministic name through the system D and UDEV for these sub functions, um, similar way as virtual and physical functions. So, okay, so what does these requirements mean to, to implementing this in a Linux kernel? Is uh, we as a user should be able to create um, and slice a device. Um, we started with a slice, but now it's a Debian port. Um, at the end of our discussion. So the user should be able to create one device at a time rather than say to enable 256 devices at a time, which can take a fairly long time. Um, this sub function does not need to enable SRIOV because it's not a PCIe VF being exposed. So we should be able to configure and create these sub functions without SRIOV. Um, Subfunctions runs on top of the existing PCI device. So you should be able to share your resources such as an IRQ resource with the PCI PF for other subfunctions. At the same time, you should not be able to share the PCI bar, which is directly accessed by the application. Sometimes it's mapped to the user space as well um, through an RDMA device. And therefore the PCI bar is a non-shared resource uh, between the uh, multiple subfunctions or its parent PCI device. Um, this subfunction, since we want to um, name them uh, deterministically, we need to have a backing with a, with a bus. And therefore, this lives on a, a new software bus. And we'll see that in more detail. And it follows the same process as um, any other bus device that follows uh, to have a probe, the move and power management, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel to uh, to handle the power management uh, differently uh, just because it was a sub function, which is not the idea. So we should be able to replace the existing kernel infrastructure for uh, uh, handle the power management events. Um, okay, so this was our first part of the understanding the user requirements and getting the picture clear. The second part is uh, the getting to know the current state of the Devlink uh, interface. Um, as you might have guessed by now that we want to use the Devlink interface for sub function management. Um, let's understand what's the current state uh, of the Devlink and why it was chosen compared to a few other options that, which are obviously not so good, but it's it's worth to, to, to add it up. So today, the Devlink interface is the one that exists that uh, exposes um, a device level management without involving any of the classes. For example, VPA, RDMA, or Net class. Um, these are the, um, the classes that exist today, uh, apart from the other block and several other classes. But in context of um, networking devices, um, the Devlink offers uh, device management without attaching to any of these um, any of these uh, specific classes. Uh, so what do we have? We have a very rich um, health reporters and um, health configuration and the recovery of some of these resources as well when they discover the errors. Uh, we can do a device configuration through device parameters or uh, port parameters. And with this feature, we can reload the device without unloading the drivers. Um, and which is very helpful when you want to um, only specify and modify only few device parameters. 
without unloading the driver, um, which is serving other devices and they are already in use um, by the applications. Uh, currently, DevLink is mainly used or widely used over the networking um, um, by networking uh, stack and not so much in by the other stacks, but it is, it is, um, it is not uh, tied to the networking stack. Um, one of the most um, uh, important feature that, that's useful is uh, the DevLink interface is, is uh, the, the instance is a network namespace aware. And it's a syscaller friendly that enables us to do several of the automated uh, testing over uh, over the um, over the kernel to make sure that uh, all the user kernel interfaces are are solid enough. Now, um, if we see here, the the third second part of the Devlin is the ECP representation. Um, all the offload configuration is, is accessible and enabled via the Devlink interface. So by default, the SRIOV works in a legacy mode and uh, the system mode can be enabled again through the Devlink. It also has a close tie-up with the representer uh, for each of the e-switch port, which is represented via NetDev and its information is accessible through the Devlink. Uh, for example, it's it's the attachment to its PF, PF for a separate message. Um, the last part is um, even though the Devlink supports the, the representation uh, and the e-switch, um, the e-switch is still an optional part of it. So um, the often question comes in the mailing list discussion is, uh, well, Devlink is um, e-switch attached. So uh, what do we do if our device does not have the e-switch? And um, it's it's straightforward that the e-switch is optional to the Devlink uh, representation. So a device does not have an e-switch, it should still uh, work just fine. So what we see in this uh, diagram is a PCI device with a PF or a VR. And um, on the right side, we see here three class devices uh, through either one or multiple drivers. In this example, it's multiple drivers being used. Um, which is an MLX5 core and MLX5 ID here. And uh, on, the, on the left side, what we see is a Devlink representation of it, um, through which all the uh, e switch configuration happens. So even though it's monolithic driver today, MLX5 core, but essentially it has a two piece to it, the e switch driver and uh, the net device class. Now let's look at the second part of it. Um, how, so how does the Devlink interface um, is being used when we have um, a split networking stack? Excuse me. One is a um, one is a Linux kernel which is running on the NIC itself, um, which is managing the e-speech, which is on our left side here. And on the right side, what we see is the guest, uh, the host operating system. Uh, this is where the PCI PF, VF, and in the future, we want to see the sub function uh, running side by side with a PF. Uh, so in this model, we can see that um, the, the isolated um, kernel uh, running on the NIC runs the e-switch. And uh, typically the user running this application does not have a direct access to the, the secure NIC here on the left. And uh, as we saw in the user's requirement, the first one is the user should be able to create the NIC, um, a virtual NIC. Um, we call it a sub-function here, um, just to match with the PCI PF and a virtual function. Um, so user should be able to create this NIC from the, from the NIC side, and that NIC should be hot pluggable on the host um, the, the, the guest host um, system on the right side of here. So we will see in a few moments um, why, um, how, how that's being achieved. Um, but before we jump to the, the Devlink part of it, um, let's, let's understand that why the Devlink uh, management is being chosen. Is um, today, what we have is an IP link command. 
to, to configure the VF parameters. There are six or seven VF parameters that can configure. Uh, that's been managed through the IPLink command. But IPLink command does not uh, fit all the requirements. Uh, primarily, it's its inability to follow the create, configure, and deploy model. It, it needs to get involved with the CCFS part of it uh, to bind and unbind the driver after the necessary configuration is done. Secondly, um, the user needs to enable the VFs again for the CCFS. And there is a complex locking involved of the, the device lock as well as the netlink and the devlink part of it. So this, this is fairly um, uh, complex as well as it does not uh, address the requirements of the need. Um, it, it, it does not uh, handle these functions today. So that's something it's hard to, to extend here. Um, and, and mainly it's missing the representation with the switch to model. Um, as the representer and the Devlink port is the one that um, extends the current switching functionality. So it makes sense to extend the Devlink uh, switch to model uh, for the sub functions rather than extending the IP set command, um, which is actually not possible when we talk of two systems. Um, as we have seen here, the IP link command is just not usable on the NIC because the SRIOV is not even enabled here. The SRIOV is enabled on the right on the guest host system. So that's why we will need something generic, unique enough um, that can be done through the Devlink uh, that works in both the use cases, if these two are single system or a dual system mode. Um, second, second option ruled out, uh, second and third are very interconnected is either to use CC CCFS or CONFIGFS. Um, as soon as we expose the CCFS, um, it, it opens the security problem to um, that um, it's gonna be network namespace aware or not. And uh, that's something that we want to avoid. Um, the net leak is pretty baked into it to handle that scenario. Uh, CSFS and ConfigFS misses um, um, the main uh, error reporting capability where a uh, user gives an incorrect parameter or, uh, uh, or a configuration command. Um, there is just one way to return the error is an error code. And that does not tell that out of six parameters which were wrong. Um, Netlink is, is fairly uh, mature enough with the extended app. Um, third, when we want to scale to large number of sub-functions um, in the range of hundreds, um, it may not be a good idea to create the configuration files for each of the small parameters and configure and consume the inode entries. And all of this applies to the configurators as well, um, that it misses um, some of the networking features that we've done. And, and, and creating some of these interface with um, Another uh, representer model uh, just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, the other option which we would like to rule out is um, why not create a character device with an IPL or um, the right command to do all the configurations, um, which which can be done through the existing networking or leveling interface. And I think we would be reinventing the wheel um, in in taking up this approach because. Um, Netlink already has the features for tracing, errors, network namespace, TLV attributes, um, all the nested attributes that can be extended. Um, and, 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 and implementing all of that over again, over the, 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 the character device or app tell, yeah, just doesn't make sense. Um, so I think that way that, that the Devlink is fairly mature, uh, that addresses all the needs um, of the user to create uh, the sub-functions um, um, and manage and configure them. And hence, let's see the flow of how, how users would like to see them being created and used. So um, the three-step process is, uh, is a fundamental to managing sub-function is create. Um, when it's created, it is uh, practically in an inactive state or an unused state. The second step is configure, where the user does the necessary configuration uh, for a sub-function. Um, 
ends with the center MAC address. And once the configuration is good enough um, that the device is actually usable, um, the third phase comes is the deploy. And in the deploy phase, the, the device is deployed either on the local system or onto the, on the external host system in which this NIC card is uh, connected. All the three steps are done on the NIC side uh, where the e-switch is located. Uh, again, e-switch is optional, but in, in our case, the e-switch exists um, and the user would like to use it using the PC offloads in an open source manner. So the three commands happens on the e-switch system. Now the question happens, what, what is the case if we have a non-smart NIC or, or just a NIC with the e-switch on it? Um, which perfectly works fine because then you have a single system and the NIC uh, has the e-switch on it. It's a single system who's going to do create, configure, and deploy commands. So very similar to um, uh, SRIOV devices that exist without uh, the smart NIC configuration. So uh, what happens in the create and delete? Um, create and delete is fairly straightforward. It's been done through a doubling port. Um, initially, um, we started with uh, something called virtual device. Then we thought um, a slice would be a better name to say slice of the device as a portion. Um, um, but um, I think overall in upstream, we agreed that the doubling port is, uh, is a better suitable that has can have a port function, um, which is what uh, we can configure. Um, the, the port function object is the one that represents um, the host side of functionality. It's, uh, it's better to note the difference between the port function and the port. Um, since the port is attached to the e-switch and there is only one port for the whole device um, for a sub-function. Um, so the port represents its own um, the e-switch side of capabilities while the port function represents the capabilities or the attributes, I'm sorry, not the capabilities, but the attributes. The attributes of the function, it can be a PCI PF or a virtual function, SRIV, or it could be a sub-function. And it's, uh, it's good to notice that it's, it's a unified interface, regardless of being a virtual function or a sub-function. That gives a much easier access to the users on how the, how they can switch over between using virtual functions or the functions. Um, the second, uh, sorry, the second part of it is the deploy. Um, when the user chose to create a doubling port, um, the user has chosen whether he wants on this system or the other system um, the, on the on the external host system, and that has a strong tie up with uh, how the representers are created for this port. We will see the example in a moment. Um, but in the final stage of the deploy is very similar to a hot plug uh, or a hot unplug of the device where um, um, an already configured device uh, shows up into the host system where it's being deployed. So let's see the examples uh, in a moment and let's do a um, dive of uh, the software stack involved in uh, supporting this. So the user starts from the e-switch system. Um, as a user, he would issue a doubling command to say, add a port. Uh, it comes to the different module here, which uh, calls the callback function of the index type core driver here, which is the vendor driver. And the vendor driver um, issues any firmware or device specific commands to add the port. Um, and at the same time, the representer device is also created um, for this different port. And the user now can configure the OBS policies or rules or the PC rules. OBS is obviously not mandatory, but I just took an example here to, to show that it's been usable to the representative. Um, the system B or the UDEV will um, rename the representative net device based on the switch port name and switch ID being exposed for the stepping port. Uh, this gives us the, uh, the vendor neutral way to name the um, the representer device of the PF, VF, and SF. For PF and VF, we already have it. Uh, Sub-function is, is just an extension to make use of the existing 
which can do many things. Okay, so if you have created the device, the next step is the configuration. He would do the configuration using the same tool here, um, using a port function. Um, and the third step would be to activate this device so the configuration is done. So when it's activated, we can see that this through the arrow that if this device is being created for the user's host system, uh, in this example, I took two different systems because it's easy to visualize. And once with the two system view is clear, then it's, it's very easy to see that it's the same thing works on the uh, single system too. So when, when it's being deployed, it's deployed onto the remote system where for the sub function shows uh, event comes up saying, well, there's a hot plug event and the PCI here for which the device is created would create a word plus device. Uh, this is the word plus device that would um, show up on a software bus called a word dev. And now this is a ready device so that um, the word plus driver can match to it using the classic probe and remove functions. Uh, probe for the hot plug event and uh, remove for the unplug event. And when the driver shows up, uh, when it's loaded, then he would create its own class devices. Um, it could be combination of these three in a device, IDMA or VDPA, uh, or just a few of them. And uh, system B here running would name the IDMA and the devices uh, based on the naming scheme that would be extended for the sub function. So with this, we, um, we get a clear view of how um, how um, a cloud user can create uh, and activate the, the device from the e-suite side and the applications running on the host system can make use of it. So I think it's time to see some of the examples at the devlink level to, to get a feel of um, how, how the commands are gonna run and how the naming scheme looks like. So uh, we go through the same example sequence is a port add. When, when you add a port, you say on PCI device, my flavor is SF. Uh, on PCI SF flavor, create a device for PF number zero with a SF number 46. I just chose a random number, user, user chosen number 46 to, to show, but it could be an auto selected way where the user does not choose, uh, but the system can choose whichever is the free SF, we can pick the device. However, in most, most cases, the user might want to choose the SF number because we will see how it's been attached to the several naming schemes that, that is being baked with the, the number and scheme. So once the port is added, the user issues a command in the import show. Um, and the, the port is, is visible using this new port index one. And the representer device is being constructed using um, the naming scheme EF0 and SF46, which is what user has passed. Um, the third step user would do is to do the configuration. Um, the port configuration, in this example, we are doing only two configurations, actually one, one, which is just the MAC address configuration. So the MAC address is configured and the user activates the device. Um, it is important to note that the, the, it's, the activation should be done only after the MAC address is being configured. So all configuration followed by the state will activate the device at the end. We'll see the port delete in a moment after we um, see some more examples. So um, a devlin this, we are still at the devlin port show command, still on the e-suite side. Uh, this is just a JSON representation of uh, uh, various fields here. You will see the, the attached state, the operational state in a moment. So we saw, we saw in the previous um, command here that the, the user activated um, this port function. And when the state was activated, the device is expected to show up onto the host system. 
So on the whole system, if you see at the Devlink level, um, this is a PCI device that exists. The zero is the PF number. Um, on this PF, a new subfunction showed up and which is named after this PSF number 46. Now we can see that since the user specified it, he wants to see the same number even after um, this configuration is done across several reboots. Um, um, and when the health reporters are run, um, if the scripts are written onto the host, which is expecting it to be running on SF number 46, uh, we don't want it to break. And that's why the device naming here for the sub function is picked up based on the SF number and its parent PCI device, unlike um, a word first device. Because on a word first or software device, the IDs could be, um, could be a random number and, and um, the user script would start failing. And hence, it's, it's desired to have the, the Devlink scripts and the Devlink infrastructure to have the SF number and the parent PCI device built into it. And the last command that we would like to see is the Devlink port show. Here, if you can see the, the, the net device is created, this is the class device created for this function with its own uh, UDA name scheme enhanced, which is uh, S46. S stands for the sub function and this is the function number. Um, so keep in mind, these are the patches um, that you would like to have. Uh, this is the RFC that's been posted a uh, few months back and been reviewed a uh, few times over the, over the mailing list. And this is, these are the patches that we would like to carry forward in 5.10 and 5.11. Um, so I'm almost about to uh, time, to do a time check. I'm close to uh, 30 minutes. Um, these are the two parts of detail that I wanted to go through, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll take an overview. So this is basically a state machine of the subfunction. Um, it enters into an inactive state by default and the user is expected to activate it. And when it's activated, we saw the sequence that it, it creates the device onto a new bus, onto a host system, it's a hot plug event. And when it's inactivated, uh, it's a hot unplug event. And we would like to have the hot unplug as a, as a graceful event. So in most cases, it would be a graceful where the, on the EC system, the user can destroy the device and uh, wait for driver to get unloaded. And once it's uh, unloaded, the user can delete the device. So the two states are being split out. Um, one is the port function state which is what we saw in our uh, previous state machine here. The, the next state machine here, what we see is of the, um, of the driver state. And uh, the, the e-switch system needs to know what's the state of the device, uh, if the driver is detached or not uh, from, the uh, from the device, so that it's safe to remove the device and reprovision or reactivate the device again um, onto the same system. So here we can see that um, by default, it, it, it is into a detached state. And when it's activated, uh, a new word bus device gets created and its probe is being called. Uh, the driver binds to it and the device moves into an attached state. And when, when it's removed in a graceful way, the remove moves it into a detached state. It is the ECU side's um, user's responsibility to monitor the state and make sure that the device is removed after it's been detached. Um, and in, in, in the case when uh, the driver is misbehaving, um, in that case, the ECU system would keep marking as, keep marked as detached and it would wait for enough timeout before declaring that this, this device is not usable um, or if the PCI PF resets into the host system, in that case, the device is reusable because it was a PCI FLI reset that happened and now the device state is being cleared. So in either of the two cases, it would move into a detached event in, in a error flow. And in a graceful way, the, 
the drivers removed would move the device into the detail um, that that aligns um, um, our three three parts um, or the part of the jigsaw puzzle is um, the user requirement the current state of the doubling and uh, the proposed uh, doubling extensions that we would like to do uh, through the doubling code to handle all the sub functions um, all the three create configure and uh, deploy tools um, these are the rfcs um, that we have reviewed uh, over the mailing list over the last uh, few months. Uh, some patches are involved, uh, mainly around port function to manage the port from the e switch side or from the host system. Um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to post uh, over my email. Um, while we are at it, we still have some of the open issues. And uh, the open issues are something that you see on the screen is um, um, we are missing the host annotation for the multiple hosts. Uh, in, in this diagram, we saw there are two hosts involved. Uh, I'll go quickly over the, the slides. Okay, so we see here there are two hosts involved, the e switch system and the user. And some application user might want to create the sub function on the e switch system itself. And both can have the same PCI naming scheme because they both belong to two different root complexes. So the PCI device name 0300 BDF can be same here on the user host system too. And that's why um, we need an annotation to say, create the device on this particular host. So this is something that we would like to try early on, uh, to have the consistent naming for this function. Uh, the second open item in a while is um, the prerequisite is to have the virtual bus, what was being merged into the kernel, uh, which has more use cases than just the sub function. Uh, so once this is done, we would like to use this into the subcompany series. Uh, the third and the typical task is to have the provisioning flow um, for the VF and SF being same. Uh, currently, the VFs are enabled from the host system using the CFS, and that's relatively a hard flow to achieve at this point. Um, the two, some of the minor points that I see is um, in future, if we need to enable the IMU on the word first, then that's something um, may be required and we should do um, as the time appears. Um, and the fifth one is to, to enable specific class devices on a particular sub function or virtual function. Uh, for example, have RDNA and that device and VDPA all enabled together or only some of them, depending on the use case. Uh, we believe that this configuration should be done on the host system where it's actually being used. So how, how a device should be used is uh, likely a config that should live into the host system rather than on the e system. system. Um, so these are, these are the, the open pending uh, issues that uh, likely would like to have uh, addressed in subsequent series. Um, once the infrastructure is being built. And that brings the, my session to an end. Uh, if you have questions and comments, uh, feel free to send me an email. Or um, if you'd like to discuss on the mailing list, um, there are links to the page. Uh, we can discuss over mailing list as well. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you, Parab. So that actually put us just a little bit over time. So why don't we um, maybe uh, look at a few of these questions and then we'll proceed into the happy hour uh, part of this. Uh, so I wanted to cover um, Salil's question, IO, MMU, SMMU on ARM64 system provides protection at stream ID RID level for PCIe. Uh, PFs and VS, but if I understood correctly, sub functions are further partitioning of VS PFs. 
if yes, how protection is insured um, across subfunctions carved out of the same VFPF. Uh, do you have a comment on that, Prof? Yes. Um, so, so you're right. The subfunction is further partitioning the PF and a VF. So, if um, it, only if you map a subfunction to a VM uh, through some higher level driver, only then some sort of protection is needed, either through pass ID or an IOMMU platform IOMMU uh, device for subfunction in the hypervisor. But in, in use cases um, uh, to use either as a container or in the bare metal uh, setup, uh, each of the sub function has its own bar memory. Uh, so even if it is mapped to as an RDMA device to the user space, it's secure. Um, and one sub function cannot really do the DMA to the other sub functions uh, queues. So it's, so it's protected if it, as long as it's used in single OS. Okay, with regards to exposing the subfunction as a mediate, mediate, mediated device, not medicated device, uh, I kind of like the, the, uh, the mediated device. Um, so you said it doesn't request all the requirements I supplied here and uh, Greg KH and others don't like exposing subfunctions. Uh, so uh, what are your comments on that or any more comments? No, I think that's it. We I posted the patches to expose a function with uh, as mediated device, and um, the feedback was not to abuse the MDEV bus for this purpose, which is very specific to a VFIO. So maybe it should be used if we want to expose the MDEV on top of the sub function, so like, um, but not not really to to anchor the subfunction devices uh, to bind to the driver through the MDEV is not the approach. Okay, and Amritha says subfunctions can be used for bare metal containers, but subfunctions for containers within a VM would need MDEV, MDEV device as well. I, I guess that's a question. I guess so. If, if uh, we haven't worked out the, the exact mapping of how to map a subfunction to a um, to a VM. So yeah, maybe MDEV can be one option given the framework already exists in the kernel. Uh, but I'm not sure of the performance uh, that MDEV can service uh, for the networking workload for 64 byte packets. Okay, and one more question. Is switch host split a hard split? Meaning if we enable the switch device, will we still be able to use TC on the host? Um, yes and no. So I think TC is still usable on the host on the sub function. Uh, but the, 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 switch side, the representer is on the, on the switch side. So, um, all the TC commands being issued on the representer is only available on the switch side. Does that answer your question or? That was Masha. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, mostly yes. So that means that if uh, we run the, um, let's say the control plane on the smart NIC, we are unable really to control too much from the host, right? That's the mostly for the bare metal uses cases, right? That's right. The host is pretty much not trusted. So host adding the rules can inject traffic into any tenants network. And that's why the, the mm -hmm. switch is on them. Um, on the next side on, on a different host. Okay. Okay, so let's um, let's wrap up the, this. Thank you, Parv.